The first thing, you know, I wanted to point out, um, because they mentioned it in the film, but this, of course, um, sort of always happens whenever I'm teaching um, Dominican and Haitian history or the history of the island of Haiti as a whole, um, Hispaniola, as it was renamed by um, Columbus in the 15th century, is that this question of the Massacre River that they bring up um, and you saw that the opening uh, commentary running across the screen is about the 1937 um, attempted genocide by uh, Dominican dictator Rafael Trujillo. Um, but actually the river, that's not why the river is called Massacre River. Um, the river was, was named that after a much earlier 1728 slaughter of 38 buccaneers by Spanish authorities. And the reason I think it's always important to point out is that 38 people's deaths were, are the reason for the name of that river, yet the Haitian deaths, which were in the thousands, are a part of history um, that is largely not taught um, and, and untold, um, of course, outside of uh, the island itself. Um, so it's really important, I think, to remember that because so much of what is happening in this film, the language that is used of settlement, illegal immigration, over and over, um, one individual referring to the big house, which is house, uh, the slave, uh, the quarters of the slave masters, quote unquote, were referred to um, in under the period of colonialism, is really important because Haiti and the Dominican Republic do not just share this island, um, but they share a really important history. Um, and so one person on the Dominican side said, Haiti has their island and we have ours. But actually, of course, as we know, um, there is one island separated by this Dajabon River um, called the Massacre River. Um, and I want to point out as well that um, Haiti and the Dominican Republic under the colonial period, of course, were one island under Spanish rule. Um, formally in 1697, the Western Third that is now Haiti um, was Saint-Domingue and became under French control. But the island actually changed back and forth um, under colonial powers several times. Um, under Toussaint Louverture in 1801, the whole island was a part of the French Republic. Um, the 1795 Treaty of Basel had ceded um, the eastern two-thirds to France. Um, then after Haitian independence in 1804, even though Jean-Jacques Dessalines as emperor claimed sovereignty over the whole island, actually the French were still operating a colony on the side that now the Dominican Republic um, until 1809. Um, and then we have a period called reunification from 1822 to 1843 um, under Jean-Pierre Boyer, uh, president of the Haitian Republic. And this is really important because because this is one of the Dominican talking points that even though as the research of scholars like Anne Eller and others has shown, the reunification period happened with the frank consent and support of the inhabitants of the eastern part of the island because Boyer abolished slavery that was still in existence under Spanish rule. Um, the Dominican elites consistently use the fact of reunification for this 20 or so years until the coup d'etat against Boyer in 1843 and Dominican independence in 1844, they use this as a talking point to suggest that Haitians are the ones who colonized the eastern side of the island rather than Spaniards to whom many Dominican elites tie their heritage. We saw that so much of the Dominican population is of direct African descent, yet there's this uh, constantly throughout Dominican history, particularly beginning in 1846 with the attempt of Spain to re-annex the island, this uh, the suggestion that the real heritage of the Dominican people um, is, is in, in Europe. Um, the other thing I would mention is that Haitians, when you look at Haitian writing, um, tend to view the separation between Haiti and the Dominican Republic as quite unnatural, as an accident of geography. Um, if we look to the Haitian playwright and poet, um, René Philotet, he has, um, Edwish Dantik has a novel, which I'll talk about in a moment. The Farming of Bones is the more famous novel about the 1937 massacre, but Philoctet actually has an earlier novel called Le Peuple des Terres Mêlées, um, the people of this earth sort of mingled together, um, or the people of the blended lands. And this is a novel about the Dominican and the Haitian peoples. This is, these are his words. It calls for harmony between the two because whether we want it or not, 
the dissension, dissension and the hatred between these two peoples are for me but an accident of history. History has stupidly, ridiculously divided these two peoples. These two peoples who have had violent disputes about their governments are in fact only one people. These are two peoples who on the border speak the same language, which is neither French nor Spanish, but what I would call a border language. A Dominican at the border speaking to a Haitian learns Creole words just as the Haitian learns Spanish words. Um, and I do want to leave you with some words from uh, some discussion rather of Edwidge Dante Katz, uh, 1999, The Farming of Bones. Um, in this work of historical fiction, many of you may have read this, Dante Cat transports readers to the Dominican Republic, to the border town of Alegria, and there Haitian workers are living a cane life. So this is what the Dominican woman, as she's walking through the settlement, is attempting to try to explain away. She's trying to say the man who says he descends from these cane workers is too young. She's talking about this moment where they Haitians are engaged in the brutal work of planting and cutting sugar cane, many at the behest of the Dominican government. And uh, Dante Cat calls that travail de puzo the farming of bones, so travaité puzo in Haitian Creole. Hewing closely to the historical record, Dante Cat captures the horrors of Dominican dictator Rafael Trujillo's massacre in 1937 of tens of thousands of Haitians living and working along the border. The more fictional sections follow the escape of Amabel Desir, who had many years before witnessed the death by drowning of her parents. So you see all of this history is evoked in the film by Michelle Stevens, who is um, of Haitian descent herself, born in Haiti, actually. Both of Amabel Desir's parents were migrant herbal healers and were trying to cross the Dajabon River, which you saw, which is very, very, um, it's not a calm river. Um, and this is the river that today um, remains separating Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Amabel in Dante Ka's novel will eventually lose her lover, Sebastian Onius, to the troops of the Generalissimo after Trujillo gives orders to have all Haitians killed. And this is why it's so disturbing bumping up against the historical record to hear the rhetoric of go inside their homes and drag them and hang them and kill them and murder them because it is a repetition of a situation that has already occurred in Haitian and Dominican history. And the reason that for me, this film is so important is the more people know about it, that this, this is not innocent language. It's language that we see in border conflicts here in the United States. It's language that we see in the border conflicts with Israel and Palestine that was evoked in the film that the Israeli for, uh, prime minister is suggesting to the Dominican president to build the wall, for example. Um, so as Haitian characters are tortured or executed um, in Dante Ka's book, in the, the the historical record, it is because they cannot trill their R. Someone asked about this in the chat to pronounce perejil, the Spanish word for parsley. Um, and so there are other books about this that take that moment um, that call it the parsley massacre, because that was the way for those who asked um, in this conflict, the 1937 conflict, how do you distinguish between a Haitian and a Dominican, especially one at the border who's going to speak some versions of Spanish, French, and Haitian Creole, as well as border languages mixed together, was the way that they were pronouncing uh, certain words. We saw this also evoked in the documentary at the beginning, like your Spanish is, is not really good, it's not fluid, so that something can call into question, even if the name's correct, the birth certificates, things are in place, there's some reason to question, and it tended to be, as we saw, darker-skinned Dominicans of Haitian descent who were subjected to this extra scrutiny. Um, and so in uh, Dante Ka's novel, I'll leave you with this quote, what she's really trying to point out is that the founders of Haiti, the, the actions that they created in abolishing slavery um, in 1804, making Haiti the first nation um, in the Western world to permanently abolish slavery, actually trickled over to the Dominican Republic, particularly under Boyer, who for all his flaws was able to abolish slavery on that side of the island. And so she says, one of her characters says rather in the book, when Dessalines, Toussaint, Henri, uh, meaning Henri Christophe, when those men walked the earth, we were a strong nation. Those men would go to war to defend our blood. 
in all this, our so-called president says nothing because we do have a conflict between the two uh, governments, the Haitian government and the Dominican Republic in this. And that is why these individuals are stateless. So she says, there's nothing at all being done to the front of the children of Desalines, the children of Toussaint, the children of Henri, they shout nothing across this river of blood. And I'm really looking forward to, to your questions. That was wonderful, Dr. Do uh, Dow. Uh, we do have some questions that were already placed in the chat. Um, uh, one is um, a question about whether the international community has recognized uh, this crisis, and if so, what has been done about it? Um, I would say it depends on what we mean by international community. There are certainly, um, there's activists and there's organizations um, who are recognizing this problem. Um, certain members of Congress, uh, Maxine Waters, for example, are recognizing this, this conflict. But um, I think on the whole, the, the situation of Dominicans, I, I even hesitate to say of Haitian descent. I would rather say black Dominicans, but that is also a neologism because as someone pointed out in the chat, Dominicans by and large 80% are actually black. So we can use, Dominicans and Haitians have many words to describe. It's a different history, different levels of skin color and skin tone. But I would say the difference between the Haitian side of the island and the Dominican side is, being nobody on the Haitian side says they are Milat or refers to someone as Milat as a way of not saying that they're black. There is a recognition still. It really is about skin color and class a lot of times and privilege and elite status these, that these words are attached to, even though they sound like racial words and they are, but they, they have, they're layered with meaning. Um, and so I would say that the, the conflict is hard to recognize, it's hard to understand. Um, and I see that reflected in the chat because how do you take a person whose family has lived in the Dominican Republic for generations and gener upon generations and then say that they are actually a Haitian? And I think that uh, when I look at the dispute, um, the war really between with, that Russia is perpetuating upon Ukraine and I'm hearing about it every single day in the news because it is important, it actually does make me think about whose lives, whose crises get to be the subject of multiple international inquiries of every head of state paying attention and having to mention it in a speech. And so in that regard, I would say the international community as a whole is ignoring this problem and conflict. When, it, when the Dominican president first made the rule about the retroactive sort of stripping people of nationality, it was in the news. But just as the assassination of the Haitian president dominated several news cycles and then went away, and that conflict and struggle and crisis is also not yet over. So I would say we're seeing a repetition of various historical circumstances where Haitians are just not seen as important enough to warrant the kind of attention, for example, that Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Russia are often get. And one thing I would add uh, to that question is, um, you can actually go online and sit in front of your computer and watch um, uh, press conferences and news release and, re release and reports from the United Nations. Uh, so if you take the time to monitor that uh, and to see what is being talked about uh, in terms of the Dominican Republic and Haiti and this particular issue. Um, we have another uh, question in the chat um, that is sort of similar in a sense, but it talks about, um, uh, it says, why do you suppose the Dominicans accepted refugees fleeing the Holocaust in the 30s? yet yeah, kill so many Haitians along the same time. Uh, and I guess the, the uh, Dr. Bristol uh, asked the question in referring Holocaust and referring to the Jews under uh, the Nazi regime in Europe. Um, well, I would say, I mean, the easy answer of course is, is race because um, many in, it is very, very interesting. Um, there's, there are other documentaries about this. And so one documentary can't do everything, but, but one of the things 
things that you'll see if you um, check out the Henry Louis Gates Jr. Um, it's a 10 part documentary about black and Latin America, but there's one um, episode rather of, or, you know, 50 minute segment that's about Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And it's jarring because you see, you know, Haitians being interviewed on the Haitian side and they're explaining Haitian history and talking to him. Then you go to the Dominican side and you see people who look basically exactly like the people on the Haitian side talking about blackness as if they themselves are not also black. And so there is a, there is a difference in understanding of what the racial heritage and the racial descent of Dominicans is. And that means that Dominicans, as we saw in this documentary so nicely, tend to identify with other groups of people who are claiming that they have a um, natal or original right to a, a birth land. And so, so much of Dominican, if you listen to the language, it mirrors the language of Israel and settlement. This is what we're going to call a neighborhood. There are, in fact, places that could be termed a settlement, but that word was used in the documentary to describe places where Haitians just live, people, people of Haitian descent, rather, Black Dominicans who can tie their origins to the Haitian side of the island. But again, I say all of that with a grain of salt because almost every Dominican also has, there was just too much movement between the two sides and too much synergy and too much unification at various moments to be able to make the kind of separations that Dominicans would like to make, yet that separation, that language is really important because it allows them to say, this is our homeland. It, it allows, it's, it's a nationalist movement that actually ends up sounding a lot like various claims to, to pieces of land on the grounds of indigeneity, even though that is also throwing that into makes a very complicated scenario. Um, but there is a large part of the Dominican population that claims Taino heritage as a way of saying, the land is is actually really ours. So so I would say um, while I can't answer the question sort of um, definitively that those are some of the reasons why we might see something that looks incongruous uh, to us. Is is this uh, issue um, particular to the island, um, or do you see this reflected? in other areas of the West Indies or the Caribbean? Yeah, that's a, this is reflected in other areas of the West Indies. So the Bahamas are really close to Haiti and they um, there's been a lot of migration uh, to the Bahamas from Haiti. And so we see the same types of border conflict and, and really um, the world perspective on global migration and global immigration is important because, for example, um, in France, if the Haitians who go to France experience none of this problem, but who experiences these problems? The, uh, who, which immigrants who go to France? Well, North Africans, West Africans, people from the former um, region of Andochine, Indochina, the former colonies that, that France had, because anytime you have groups of people, and someone in the film said this, the volume, it's the volume. And so anytime you have large amounts of people, that tends to create a border conflict um, without, and then, it, and then it becomes about how do you stop people from coming instead of how do we solve the problems and the issues that make it necessary for the people to come in the first place. And in the situation with France and North Africa, that is destruction of the natural economies and natural habitats of places like Algeria, not just through colonization for more than 100 years of colony colonization, but also a huge civil war, huge aggressions of that, that cause places that were formerly colonized to suffer economic insecurity, all, all the kinds of things that make for then, then you have to immigrate. I mean, and then we even see the, the of course, sheer irony is that um, when Dominicans come to the United States, they receive a treatment that is not necessarily dissimilar depending on their class status from the way that other um, migrants from Latin America are treated, which is they're not just given the open door and you know embraced. And so we see that it really actually, it actually, 
matters so much to put it in comparative context, but it can't be but isolated on the island as many of the Dominicans in the film really want things to be, allows you to see that what would happen if you left and if you, if this was it, it, it basically prevents empathy and sympathy because it's, you can say to yourself, well, I would never, I don't try to go to someone else's country and, you know, um, and, and only because the conditions don't require you to, but I think that the situation with Ukraine and Russia should teach every person that any situation can change and require a movement. So we should constantly operate um, with, with empathy and understanding rather than this aggression and you know, hostility. Uh, one, of the, excuse me, one of the aspects in the film that um, I thought was interesting and reminded me of, um, uh, some lessons I have been taught over the last three years or so. Um, the issue of citizenship and immigration in Germany uh, is largely based on whether German, the language, is your native tongue. And so in Germany, where you have a large uh, Levant population and primarily from Turkey, uh, many people who, I mean, I'm talking about since the end of World War II, large Turkish uh, immigrants migrated to Germany, took jobs to help rebuild the country. And their children and grandchildren who maintain uh, their Turkish or Arabic languages um, are now being uh, sort of denied the rights as German citizens is, you know, you have people of Turkish descent, but Germany is the only country they've ever known. And, um, and so if German is not their native tongue, then that's sort of one of the barriers uh, that are put up. And it was sort of, as you brought up uh, and reminded us in the film, very early on, we talked about your Spanish is bad, you know, as a way of setting up a barrier uh, to prevent this person who, uh, you know, was a Dominican born and citizen, although he's Haitian ancestry, but Dominican. Um, and so those types of uh, barriers, um, we're starting to see um, uh, be more relevant, uh, or not relevant, but uh, prevalent uh, in these discussions um, about nationality um, and citizenship and so forth. Um, it reminded me, and maybe it's not so much uh, a, a direct correlation, but uh, one of my children uh, whose classmate uh, was born in South Africa, uh, who's of European descent, refers to himself as an African-American. And she, she wanted to know from me, you know, because of course she was confused uh, and, and denied his uh, being able to say he's African-American. I said, well, it's a lot more complex than that. Um, and, um, and how do you explain that to a 13 year old? Um, so, you know, th this film, I think, um, has really, you know, brought um, a lot to the table uh, for discussion for an area that in terms of international politics, maybe we haven't paid enough attention to it. Um, and um, because there are so many themes in the Haitian slash Dominican experience that as African Americans we should be very familiar with. Um, this, the, you know, the amount of discrimination, uh, the, the, because it's part of our African American history, it's part of the experience that we've lived through uh, and our parents and grandparents have lived through. Even the, the denial of the government. Um, as the gentleman was saying to Teofilio, um, you know, it's not a personal decision of his, you know, you just don't have the proper documents, you know, and he's trying to explain to him that, 
you know, it's like, and I can relate, you know, to the whole birth certificate thing because I had issues with my own birth certificate. And, and it's hard to, you know, years later to try to explain what is wrong in your birth certificate. You know, I know who my mother is, you know, that type of thing. And um, uh, so I kind of fell for that. Um, and, you know, so in the film, I thought the film really did capture a lot. But I had one question about the film that I, I and I guess it was sort of when they were traveling back from Haiti. And um, the way that the cameraman was handling the camera, I was sort of suspecting that, was this a film where largely a lot of the footage was sort of like a hidden camera in a sense. And so you get the kind of shakiness of the camera. Yes, I mean, what I gathered from those scenes was that those may have even been taken with a cell phone kind of like laying in somebody's lap because the perspective um, at one of the checkpoints, for example, was, you know, you could see the officer leaning over. And that is, of course, we all know, again, in the African-American community here that law enforcement, even if it is legal to film them, which I'm not sure that it is in the Dominican Republic, actually. Um, I know in many countries, it's not legal to film law enforcement. They tend to not like it. And, um, and, uh, and can, so, so definitely because of what they were doing, they would want to um, conceal the surveillance. And I think that that was also true of when Teofilia went into the office. I, I suspect that him, the, the man who was interviewing him was not aware um, that he was being filmed. Um, and yeah, so it, I, I thought those were poignant moments because those are the things that people will show you when they don't know that they're being watched. Um, mm -hmm. And so you got to really see um, that their awareness of the difficulty of the checkpoints as they got closer to Santo Domingo tended out, turned out to be correct with the most severe search or, or serious search happening um, at the point right outside the city. Uh, can you tell us about a little bit about your own scholarship, uh, particularly the book that you're working on? Yes, sure. So I'm working on a, um, a narrative history of the Kingdom of Haiti that's about the life of Haiti. It's called The First and Last King of Haiti, about Henri Christophe. Um, and it's really about his attempts to protect Haiti in a very hostile world by um, opening up trade. Um, it kind of dispels the myth that Haiti was isolated by trade after Haitian independence. Um, it's true that none of the world powers wanted to recognize Haitian independence, but um, it was a capitalist world. So they felt fine trading with Haitians anyway. Um, and how he'd really set up this anti-slavery kingdom, I call it the kingdom of anti-slavery, where they went and, um, turned away slave ships, they confiscated the quote unquote human cargo, set the individuals who had been captives free in Haiti to live free lives. Um, so that there was, there is this moment of opulence and wealth because it is a kingdom and this moment of setting up schools and setting up um, infrastructure and hospitals and universities and bringing artists and doctors and vaccines. The smallpox vaccine was a big thing um, to Haiti. And this was all undone, which is why in my remarks, I said, Boyer had some things he did that was good, were good, but the um, indemnity that he signed with France um, as the price of Haitian freedom really did away with all of that. And the only reason that Boyer was able to do that was because in 1820, um, Christophe responding to a plot to overthrow him committed suicide. And um, this really set Haiti on a very different path um, from the, the one that it went down today. And I often wonder, and I wonder aloud in the book, what would have happened um, had he remained as flawed as individual as he was as well um, in power and able to carry out many of these uh, projects, which also did include reunifying the eastern and western side of the island as his predecessor de Salim wanted to do and Boyer is the one who does it. But there is a sense that there's not a reason that this island should be separately governed and that there should be animosity between two peoples who share 
the same space and have the same origins in Spanish and French colonialism and African descent because of the Euro the Atlantic slave trade. Um, and, and so it sort of encapsulates all of those moments, but by focusing on, uh, on the king himself and his family. I also found in the film the prevalence of the cultivation of sugarcane um, as a carryover uh, from the period of enslavement. And um, uh, sugarcane enslaved people on sugar plantations uh, typically had a seven to 10 year lifespan in that environment. And um, when the nationalist woman, I can't remember her name, Felice something, yes. uh, was looking for the settlement, government run settlement, uh, and the uh, older gentleman was telling her he worked on the sugar cane. They came there to work in sugar fields. And yeah, and as you mentioned, she, she walks away with, you know, he's too young to have been in sugar cane. But, um, and, you know, I immediately felt, well, you know, that's that's not true. And I'm not saying it's the same conditions as it was in the 18th or 19th century. But um, the fact that I didn't see any indication that there was any mechanical uh, cultivation of sugar mm -hmm. there, but they're still relying on this cheap, 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 cheap labor to produce the product. Um, what, what did you come away with, with this whole aspect of sugar? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you really hit the nail on the head because first of all, um, in the ads for Danilo, the president's reelection, he's standing in front of sugar cane behind, there's all kinds of especially um, for those who could read the Spanish signs as they're driving through. There's all kinds of advertisements for different sugar companies and different things about um, the sugar industry. And that was evoked by that same gentleman who said, oh, and then this company moved in and then, you know, we were left high and dry. But also it isn't just a historical situation. There's a documentary from I think 2007 called The Price of Sugar. And it's about Haitians, contemporary Haitians lured into forms of indentured servitude on um, sugar plantations of, that exist to this day along the border of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And so in that sense, it mirrors and resembles, although it is not exactly the same, the sorts of border conflicts that we have in the United States, particularly in California and the other Southwestern states with Mexican migrants who are encouraged to come to do all kinds of jobs that have to do with seasonal farming and agriculture. Mm -hmm. But the idea is they're not like supposed to stay and then seek citizenship. And in fact, even though places like California are seen as, you know, these kind of bastions of, of liberalism and like melting pots and, and acceptance, actually the English only laws um, originated in 1990s Californians to prevent uh, the full and total assimilation of Mexican migrants. So English only in schools. And so when school children came and couldn't speak English, the idea was that this happened in Orange County and in LA County, that this they weren't allowed to have second language learner classes. And so we see the conflict, it, it unfolds, it's the repeating island in a sense of um, Antonio Benitez Rojo's famous book, The Repeating Island is about slavery and the setting up of plantations. But when we look at the situation with global migration and labor today, we see that repeating island over and over again, that machine, machine, machine of capitalism. So come here, cut cane, come here, pick fruit, come here, do these things, but you can't have citizenship, you can't stay, and you will be subjected to conditions that really um, we see in the price of sugar are obviously it's not the same as slavery, but these are brutal, cane cutting is brutal, brutal work um, that rips your skin, there's blood. It's, this is backbreaking labor. And you have to think about in the Dominican sun and Haitian sun and heat and mosquitoes and, and water constantly in wounds. Um, and so the, the interesting thing about the documentary in that point was that Either it is willful ignorance, which I have a hard time believing, or there's just a sense of 
trying to deny actual realities um, by saying you can't be, you know, a cane worker because you're too young suggests that there are not who's cutting all the cane in the Dominican Republic to this day is they're mostly Haitians, people of Haitian, immediate Haitian descent most of the time, actual migrants. Um, and, and so that that little bit there is, again, either willful ignorance or um, uh, or something even more pernicious. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another uh, question about um, if you can expound upon the present political situation in Haiti. Yes, so the situation in Haiti is of course um, quite dire at the moment with the, uh, what I would describe as kind of an ongoing power struggle wrapped inside of a power vacuum. Um, with a president whose legitimacy is not just called into question, but is it's not even questionable. There isn't really legitimacy to it because the person who named him Moise uh, to his station of prime minister did not uh, have the authority to, to do so also. Um, and uh, this question of elections, there are um, a lot of the increase in kidnappings um, is like we've never seen it before. Um, in Haitian history. And I, so I would say the precarity of life in Haiti is severe at this moment. Um, and that a Haiti's island neighbors in the Dominican Republic, um, it's not as if they have offered any assistance to, um, to help determine the path or, uh, or anything really. Um, and so all there is is isolation, judgment, you know, um, and they've had plenty of dictators uh, in their own history in the Dominican Republic. And I, and I say that to say that every country um, in its moment of relative prosperity thinks that something that's happening in another country probably would never happen to them or happen there. And I think that the case of Haiti shows that things can change dramatically because at the moment when the Petro Caribe protest started over the Venezuela oil program, Haiti was experiencing a period of relative stability where things were starting to, infrastructure was beginning to be built. And that is on the, that is entirely the fault of, of politicians, but also of various international officials who allowed this situation where we have Haitian government officials siphoning money away from the Haitian people, that that Venezuela oil program is supposed to directly benefit the Haitian people, not to go into the pockets um, of, their, of their leaders and businessmen and other elites. Um, and so that is just to say that I understand the, the criticisms, but the Dominican Republic also has many, many of the same problems on a different scale um, as, as the Haitian side of the island. And the main difference being that the poverty is not the same on the Dominican side of the island. And when you have, we know this, people living in sheer poverty and precarity where they can't get clean water, they can't have food uh, security every day and shelter and shelters are all the basic necessities of life are not being met, then people are going to behave desperately. Um, and we know this and that those conditions have to be met, those minimum conditions. And then we also need to talk about, because that's not all for me, we can't stop there. We need mm -hmm. a justice, a functioning justice system, functioning elections without international interference, schools. I mean, these things seem very, very basic, but they are severely lacking uh, on the Haitian side of the island. Thank you so much, Dr. Marlene Dowd. Um, this has been a wonderful evening, wonderful program. Uh, and your knowledge and understanding and scholarship has really made us understand the film um, a lot more uh, and un understand the present situation. There's plenty of thank yous uh, coming in um, and um, I can't say it more. Thank you so much.